Hello and welcome to Travel Time to Chat with Tim Ron. All right, so I wanted to talk about something that has been on my mind and I probably should have like taken notes and stuff. So I'm on a road trip and nothing got on the radio. So I thought, well, I'll record some videos. I'm thinking about what topics to talk to you guys about. And this was, has been on my mind for a while, and I'm probably going to do another video about it, just because I think it's so important, but I want to share with you things that I've learned from the death of my mother. I know, what a sad, what a sad topic, but there are some things that I've learned and experienced when my mom passed away in January. And I'm telling you, so first of all, I just want to say, I know I talk about this a lot because it's really impacting my life a ton. Um, my mom was my best friend. We did so much together. We traveled. She sourced with me when I was going off um, to do sourcing for eBay and um, Etsy and for um, Amazon. Should we make crafts together? We have our own store on Etsy where we sold the stuff that we um, made. She made more than I did because she's had more time. Uh, so I pretty much was just marketing her stuff. There's a few of my things in there, but most of it was just hers. But really, really enjoyed it with her. So it's just been a huge, huge impact to lose her suddenly, unexpectedly. Didn't know she was going to be passing. Uh, she wasn't sick with anything, that type of thing. But one thing that I have learned, and somebody told me you should do a video about the things that you've learned and the things that your mother did that made it easier for you to process things. So my brother and I are both executors of her estate. There are four children. Uh, my brother is the oldest and then myself, and then I have two younger siblings. One is only nine months younger than me. And, and then another one who just turned 50 this year. So we're all in our 50s. And my mom, when she passed, which really I am, I'm just floored that she took, she had the organization and the knowledge, know-how or whatever to prepare us for it paperwork-wise. So she had a safe in her, um, a lockbox safe in her closet that was like for, you know, like a, a fire retardant one. Um, but it was more like a file, file folder type of system. And in it, she had all of the paperwork on life insurances, on all the receipts from um, from the sale of her house, for copies of her will, powers of attorney. Like everything was so nicely documented and filed and all that, which really made things incredibly easier um, than not having it. Now, I will say the copy of her will that was in there ends up being there was another will that she didn't have in there, which, yeah, I, we ended up finding it with the, with the lawyer's office. Actually, the court found it uh, with the lawyer's office because the lawyer had closed since then. And I know with the we got a will, and our copy of the will, the lawyer did not keep a copy, and he stated that he doesn't have a copy. We, have, we only have the originals plus a copy for our executor. So I didn't realize that hers would, would end up having it. So I called the lawyer's office that had taken over for the lawyer that had retired and they couldn't find a copy of it. So when I went to the courthouse to file, I had to file a petition for them to, even because we didn't have a, I guess we had the will, but I don't remember the whole story. Ended up being, hold on, I gotta fix something on my screen. Here we go. Ended up being that my, so the house, when my mom bought her house, she bought it, the, the house, but put it in her kids' names. This was after my dad had passed away, and the house was gonna be just, you know, just her, her living in it. So she bought it and put it in our name with her having life use. That way, if something was to happen to her and she had to go into the nursing home, which we learned when my dad and my grandmother both ended up in the nursing home before they passed, 
the government pretty much takes everything from you to reimburse them for their for their expenses. So my father's social security check, my, my grandmother's social security check when she was in there, they took all of that but they leave you $50 a month. Um, they were able to leave my mom with like the house and all this other stuff because she was still alive. But had my mom been passed when my dad went in, they would have taken ownership of the home and everything to recoup the cost of the nursing home. So my mom said, I want to make sure that I set it up. So if I go in the nursing home, you are not going to be responsible or, you know, not, they're not going to take everything they worked their whole life for, which goes back to my whole story about die with, die with zero, the book called die with zero. Please go and look at that book and read about it. It is just the concept just makes so much sense and it's completely different from what we're taught all along is to save for your retirement, save for your retirement, save, you know, like that's everything is pushed towards that, that you're not guaranteed a retirement. You don't know how long you're going to live after retirement. And when you pass away, you don't want to leave all your money to people who don't really need it. And when you could have given it to them when they were younger, when they could have used it more. So go read that book. It's really, really good. It's free audio book on YouTube. Just put in Die With Zero and you'll, and you'll find it. So anyway, so mom didn't want to go into the nursing home. She really did not want to go to the nursing home, period. But if she did end up happening to go into it, she didn't want the government to end up taking everything. Um, you know, her retirement, her 401k, her house, all this other stuff. So she was smart enough to say, let's put the house in your in the four of your kids' names and her kids' names. And um, and that way when she died, we didn't have to worry about it. we already owned the house. So we didn't have to go to probate court. Even if you have a will, you sometimes you still need to go to probate court. Now maybe not even sometimes, maybe always. So I was put onto my mom's bank account. So when she's when my dad, when she took my dad off, she put me on her account. Sorry, I'm gonna check for traffic. And that made it so again, when she passed away, I immediately had access to her money. I did not need any permission to go in and write checks to pay her bills. Um, I could go in and take all of her money out. Like all of that I could do because I was a joint in her account. Now I will warn you, if you go to put somebody joint in your account, please make sure you 100% trust them. Uh, I've shared this story before. I had a friend whose father put her sister on his account joint with her, with him I should say. Her sister went and took every penny, hundreds of thousands of dollars from that account took it all and he had no recourse he went to bring her to court and they said she had access to that account you gave her permission as joint owner she can take out 100% of that money when you're a joint owner so just be really cautious of that now you can go in and my brother was telling me that he met with a lawyer in Vermont and they told him that instead of putting his kids joint on his account you can have your kids be a beneficiary of your checking account, which I had never heard of that, that somebody can be a beneficiary. Uh, so that was new to me. Same with his car. I guess there's a special form on DMV that you can fill out and it makes somebody be a beneficiary. So if something was to happen to you, they would get your vehicle. So that is the only stumbling block, stumbling block that we really had to deal with when it came to mom's assets, because with me being on our bank account, me and my siblings owning her house, we all had access to that stuff right away when she passed, but she had a car and she was the only one that was on the title of that car, which really surprised me because she had bought out, she had, she had originally had leased it. And I think it was maybe in 2019, that she bought her lease out. And I'm really surprised at that time she didn't add my name to it. Uh, she had leased that car back when my dad was still alive. 
But anyway, so we had to deal with the car and my sister was willing to buy the car. She wanted to buy the car, not willing, but she wanted to buy it. Because honestly, if we would have sold it to the general public, we would have made more money on it. But we you know, gave her a good deal, even though she doesn't think it was a good deal. Uh, we went with the low end of the MSRP or not MSRP, but you know, when you look at like Kelly Blue Book, we went with the lowest dollar amount that it, that it showed. And my mom's car was immaculate. Like she took care of it. She always brought it in for scheduled maintenance, oil changes, all that kind of stuff. Always did that. So we had to, I had to go to court, um, fill out a paperwork and had to pay a dollar and pretty much had to have a judge make a rule that I have permission to sell my mom's car and that I could sell it to my sister. So that was the, really the only time we had to go to court. It was a pretty simple, easy process. It took like a week. Like I said, it cost a dollar filing fee. So it's really no big deal and, uh, and got that. And then my sister was able to take the car, bring that letter to the DMV here in Vermont because this all was happening in New York and was able to get the car registered under her name and so forth. So that's the deal with the with the car and everything. So that was pretty much it for assets were, were easy except for the contents of her house. And this is where things got a little hairy because one of the things my mom and dad witnessed through their own life was when my dad's parents died my dad was one of, I think, seven siblings. And there was a lot of kind of arguing. Like, all I know is that I was younger, still in high school when they passed. And I never had the opportunity. Right? I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't say I didn't have the opportunity. But my, um, my aunts and aunts, I don't know who the executor was. I think my oldest aunt, Anita, was the executor. And because there were so many siblings, they decided instead of um, having everybody come and just take what they want, which is what we did with the four siblings, we ended up having, they ended up having a garage sale. So my mom and dad had said, we want this, this, and this. And my aunt said, hey, we're not gonna give you anything. You have to come to the garage sale. So they said, you, know, you gotta come to the garage sale and you gotta buy buy the items. So my parents drove over from Vermont, drove the three hours to the sale in Messina. And the things that my mom wanted weren't even there for her to buy. So she's like, somebody had already gone through and taken some of the items. So she was really annoyed, which I don't blame her, her and my dad were really bothered that they couldn't get what they had wanted, but somebody else had already gone in and grabbed some stuff. So my dad and my mom didn't speak to a large portion of my dad's family after that. And I don't know if there was there's more to the story or what, but they that was it. Like my Aunt Anita, she was my godparent never saw her they never came to the family reunions after that uh, just never like they were just kind of shunned I guess I'm not sure exactly what, what what else went on but that was it for them and then with my grandmother when my great-grandmother passed away which I was so fortunate growing up to have both grandparents and a great-grandmother so I had five grandparents well my great-grandmother Sorry, I'm driving and listening to the GPS while I'm talking about this. So my great-grandmother had told my parents, or no, sorry, I'm getting distracted from the GPS here. I apologize. So my, when my great-grandmother passed away, my grandmother on my mom's side ended up, I don't even know, again, know the story behind it and what happened, but my grandmother there was a big argument on that side of the family. About one mile to US seven. So there was some, I don't even know what happened, but all I know is there was an argument. So my parents had said, listen, they had arguments on my dad's side of the family. There was arguments on my mom's side of the family. So my parents said, whatever happens, we don't want you four 
to end up being in any dispute when we pass. So when my parents moved from Vermont to New York, they got rid of a lot of stuff. They had said to the four of us, what do you want most out of their belongings? And I wanted this, um, this dinnerware that we ate on. Look, I gotta take a sip. I feel my throat get dry. I really wanted this dinnerware that we ate off, off from every holiday. So Thanksgiving and Christmas. It was the only time we ate off from this and it really meant a lot to me when we would do those family meals. And if family was just the six of us, I mean, there was nobody else because everybody else lived far away. So that's what I got. Um, my sister got my mom's wedding ring and I don't know what my other sister got and I don't know what my brother got. My brother ended up with a lot of stuff because he's the only male with the Robinson last name. So he got a lot of the Robinson history things, which, so when they moved, they did that. And then when they moved again, they got rid of more stuff. And my mom was one who deck always was changing around her decor. So they had would have garage sales. And the one time I went to the garage sale and there was an ice cream scoop she had for sale. And I was like, what are you doing selling my, my favorite ice cream scoop? Like that was the scoop I used all the time. So I grabbed that ice cream scoop from her garage sale. But so when, by the time she made it into what we call her tiny home, the home that she lived in when she passed away, there was not a lot in there that was nostalgia items. There were very, very few things. And we got together in February for a week. Uh, my sister was already scheduled to come over and visit my mom for that week. So we said, okay, why don't you keep that schedule, come over. My brother took time off. And then I took time off from my reselling and said, we're gonna just work on that, uh, work on the house. So the four of us were all gonna come over and work on that to get through everything and just do the bulk of, of hopefully clear out her house. Well, I had one sister who didn't come. She had, she told us why, but honestly, I'm, and I know she, she watches this, but I don't know. It's just one of those things where when, a, when your family is going through something, it is really important that you all go together and go through it. Support each other. And we didn't have that because uh, there was somebody missing. And that was really tough. But we went through her belongings and we, we had this little sticker system that actually something I kind of had came up with that said, if you want it, so my color was green. I had these green stickers, a green tape. I bought these different colored, colored tapes, little like masking tape things. And I said, if you want it, then mark it with, you know, mine was green, mark the item with green. So what we did is when we each got there and nobody went through anything until we were there and went around and marked stuff with what we wanted. So I went around and marked green with the things that I wanted. And then somebody else went around, I think my sister, or one of my sisters had pink, and then my brother had like red, let's say. And then I also had the color yellow. Yellow was my family, but not immediately me. So one of my children wanted that item. So let's say for instance, there was a pink piece of tape on something and a yellow piece of tape. The pink was my sister. Yellow was one of my kids. Well, my sister trumped any of my kids. So if I went around and I saw something that had pink or red on it, right, one of my siblings, then I knew not to even put one of my kids' colors on it. But if I wanted it for myself, then I would put my color tape on it and then the two of us would have to, you know, we would discuss and figure out who's gonna get what. Uh, there was only a few things where more than one person wanted it. And at that point it was kind of like, okay, you know, what, you get this, like for instance, there were two things that my sister and I both wanted. And we came to the agreement that you get one thing and I get one. So we kind of did that. 
Now I will say that kind of caused a problem a little bit because there were, I didn't really want a lot. The, really the biggest thing I wanted was the, uh, the craft item, not the craft, yeah, the craft items from my mother because that was something that when mom and I went shopping for craft supplies, we pretty much like split everything. We shared everything. So when she wanted a, a thing of paper, scrapbook paper, and I wanted the same book, most books had two pieces of paper in it that were the same. So we said, okay, why don't we just share this paper? You buy that book and I'll buy this book. So we shared a lot of stuff and borrowed. Like she borrowed a lot of stuff from me because I had a lot from my scrapbooking and stamping days. So I pretty much wanted that, but when it came to everything else, there really wasn't a lot of stuff I wanted or needed, so I didn't put my sticker on a lot of stuff. But it seemed like it worked out pretty well. I mean, there was times when, and, and my sister that was there, she did, she did say to me and say to both my brother and I that she, she labeled a lot of stuff. She wanted a lot of stuff. And there were times when I was like, man, I should have labeled more stuff because maybe I could have given her the stuff I didn't really want and gotten the stuff I really wanted versus she was getting 10 things here. I was getting one thing here and I could, I probably could have gotten more, could have gotten what I wanted per, pretty much. Like if I wanted two things, I probably could have gotten both things had I put stickers on stuff I didn't really want and then said, oh, well, you can have those if I can get this. Does that make sense? But I didn't, I didn't really want to play dirty. Um, and in the long run, it was the nostalgia stuff and there wasn't a lot of that. So even though maybe she wanted, um, and I can't even remember what it was. Let's say it was like mom's pots and pans or I think my brother got them, but whatever. I'll just use that as an example. Something that was newer, not nostalgia, um, like her vacuum cleaner. And I would be like, okay, yeah, you can have that because I don't need a vacuum cleaner. I got one. No problem. But the things I wanted were things that em evoked emotion. And so those were hard to not give away. But the tape system, I think, really worked well. And, you know, there were some arguments. There was some hurt feelings. But I kept saying to her, well, two, two things kept coming back to mind. One is even though I had some really hurt and I still have some hurt feelings over the sibling who didn't show, who was a no-show through all of going through my parents' stuff. No-show. 100%. Every time we got together, no-show. Okay. Alright, sorry about that. It, it just brings up a lot of emotion. So two things that I taught I told myself going through all of this is number one mom and dad did not want their deaths to create conflict okay <laughs> try not to be emotional all right number two that I told myself over and over again is when my sister and I that was present um, thankfully, my brother and I never really, I don't think we really had any disagreements through this. We, we got along really well and we were both executors and split the duties up really well. I just really worked very well together. No complaints at all. Um, so my sister, when we were going through stuff and I remember there was an incident, we were downstairs in the basement and I was talking to my brother and my sister came down and she goes, she's like, yeah, I'm really sorry that I put my sticker on so many things and if I could do it different I wouldn't have and I'm like listen this is number two this is our first time dealing with clearing out an estate this is our one and only time that we'll ever lose our mother and have to clear out her estate we've never had to do it before and we'll never have to do this again this is a one and done experience I said so so we're so we've learned, you know. What we do with that that learning is put on videos like this and pass it on to people that that someday we'll have to go through this because we'll never have to do this again. Um, both of our parents are deceased, and we won't. Now we all have in laws. Like both of my in laws are alive, and when my 
when my in-laws both pass away and my, my husband and his brother have to go through their estate and go through everything, you know, I'll pass on the knowledge that I learned and I've already passed it on. I've already talked to my in-laws. They've already started putting both of their kids on. They changed their will. They added their names to the title of their house. They've um, had them both join one of their bank accounts and you know so they're slowly starting to to put this stuff into play they're in their 80s i said it's not as important right now because you're both alive but as soon as one of you pass it will be extremely important to the remaining spouse that they make sure everything has at least one of their children's name on it if not both like they don't they have two children so it's a little easier versus my mom putting all four on everything so that has really made, made it nice to keep reminding myself that, listen, my parents would not want me to not, to not ever speak to a sibling again, right? They didn't want that for us. So I keep telling myself, don't let it get you this angry. And I don't know if there's as much anger as hurt. Okay, don't get emotional again, Tamara, come on. Get it together. Um, but the big thing is just keep saying that, listen, we've never done this before and we'll never do it again. So having forgiveness is big. Doesn't mean that you forget, but you forgive. All right, so let me wrap this up. The... The biggest things out of all of this was mom having her paperwork in order. Made life so much easier. Huge difference. So I got this book and I got some for sale in my um, eBay store if anybody is interested in one. But it's called um, I'm Dead Now What? And it's a book for you to be able to put everything down. My mom had a password book so I could get access to like so much stuff for her like her, her Facebook account her email all this stuff that I was able to get access to so I could change the information so I would have access to it later on and um, so her having the executor having a will that showed an executor so we knew who was going to be in charge of all taking care of everything that was really great, but again, I go back to saying, if you are not an executor of your parents' estate, but your sibling is, it doesn't mean you walk away from everything. You still need to play an active role in going through their stuff. Do that. Please do not leave it up to the executor to have to do that on their own. Having your elderly parents, or yourself if you're elderly, Put your kid's name on your account or find out like my brother did that there's a way to add them as a beneficiary. So having a beneficiary or having a joint account, if you are moving into a smaller home, if you're doing something along those lines at that time when you're, when you're older where you can put the house into your kid's names and then give yourself life, life use. Life use means that we could never kick my mother out of the house. It's, it's her home, it's where she's living until she doesn't wanna live there anymore. Um, even though it was in our name, we could not like sell it out from under her because ultimately she paid for the house. So having that life use, uh, it also gives them the ability to still have all of the tax benefits. So my mother being elderly, my dad being a veteran, she was able to carry on that into the property tax books on her new on her new house that she had bought. So she was able to get all those discounts and all that kind of stuff because she had life use versus if she was just like renting from us, renting with no rent, uh, that type of stuff. So that really helped out a lot. Um, I mean, really made a big difference just being able to access her, her bank account um, and being able to have the house immediately in our name upon her death. Even though it was in our name, but you know, we could do whatever we wanted. Really made a big difference. So those are the top things that I think I have learned the most um, from death. Oh, and I'll just say a little bit on grief is grief has a process. So you know, learn, read about the steps of grief. So when you're angry, when you're lashing out at people, 
when you're questioning, could you have done something to prevent their death? That's all part of the grief process. So just know that, um, you know, that that's okay. Like you might feel numb at first. Uh, for, for those who don't know, I literally had a heart attack the day my mom died. The grief, I had broken heart syndrome, which is a real thing. I had a real heart attack. I ended up in the emergency room. They transferred me to a larger hospital in Syracuse. They had to do some testing to make sure I didn't have a blocked artery because of it. And when they saw that it wasn't blocked, they were like, yeah, you have broken heart syndrome, like for real. And I did damage to my heart. And thankfully, when you have broken heart syndrome, because it wasn't a blockage, which was, I'll tell you, it was nice to have a, an internal exam through my arteries and to find out that my heart looks really good. Uh, that is nice to know, but uh, that was all re recoverable. Um, that is one thing that when you have a broken heart syndrome, if you can go get help right away and, and don't wait, right? Because if I would have waited, who knows if I would have waited another day and just kept with that chest pain, it could have been a, a lot worse of a story. Um, thankfully, I, I told my husband, I'm like, let's go to the hospital because this is, the pain was unbearable and I knew I didn't want to deal with it all night long. I probably wouldn't have gotten any sleep, but the pain was just so intense. And, um, yeah, so learn the process of grief. And yeah, you know, cause you might go through a period where I remember when my dad died, I was like, I'm not really crying much. Like, how come I'm not crying? How come I'm not sad? You know, but I didn't see my dad every day. Like I saw him every week. And cause I went, I lived in Vermont at the time and I would come home and I would see him every weekend and I would help my mom take care of him and give her some relief and all that kind of stuff every week and sometimes I'd go for a whole week because I was very fortunate I worked at home the job I had I worked at home um, for the military so I was able to you know go work from their house but all during the day I was in a in the living room working while they were in the family room watching Price is Right <laughs> my dad's favorite show um so when he passed it wasn't for like probably a month that I was really realizing that you know wow seen my dad in a month um but like my mom I saw her like all the time and talked to her every day so it was immediately when I lost her so if you're not feeling any feeling like you're not feeling any grief and then all of a sudden you find yourself being sad or angry or whatever just know that's the process but if you get to a point where you're so sad for too long so angry for too long so beating up on yourself for too long and, and you're the ju judge or your family around you is the judge of what that too long is then know it's okay to go get help I ended up reaching out a couple months after my mom died because I was so tired of crying all the time that I called my doctor and I said okay it's time now that I need an antidepressant because I am just crying all the time and I can't get through a day and even though I still cry all the time now, but it's nowhere near as often as I cried there. Now I only break down once or twice a day, if even that, you know, it depends if I'm talking about it. Obviously today talking about it makes me emotional, but if I'm just going about my normal day, I mean, I think of my mom and my dad every day, but not to the point where I'm gonna cry. Yeah, so that's pretty much it for that. All right, those are my thoughts on the process of losing your parents. So talk to you guys later. Bye.